In this video, we're going to learn about unique shaped link bars, how they compare to plain old straight ones, and why you might use them. Welcome back, fellow garage fabbers. I am Man Candy. In Suspension Basics Part 2, we talked about how link bars of various lengths and angles affect the components that are attached to them. More specifically, how non-parallel or uneven length bars cause pinion angle or camber to change, and equal length parallel bars keep all angles consistent. Today, I want to talk to you about how to determine a link bar's length, and how you can alter the shape of a link bar without changing its effective length. Effective length is the measurement that matters. Simply put, it's the distance between a link bar's two pivots, and it's what determines how that link bar will behave. Pop quiz. Which of these three link bars are the shortest? We've probably all heard that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. That said, this link bar is the shortest, right? Actually, no, because effective length is the shortest distance between the pivots. All three of these link bars are technically the same. These two link bars are stupid and couldn't be used on a real car, but they are going to help us demonstrate the effective length principle. Let's use our old two-dimensional model to see this principle in action. When we discussed parallel four links, we decided that the length of the upper bars needed to match the lower bars in order to keep our pinion angle constant. But now that we know that the effective length is determined by the distance between the pivot points, we can alter the shape of the link bar itself without changing how it operates. Let's cycle the suspension with this link installed and see what happens. Notice the pinion angle remains constant just like a parallel four link. Weird, right? Because all the pivots are the same distance apart, we essentially have an imaginary link here to create our parallel four link. With this C-shaped link, we can see the same result. As long as the bar retains its shape, and the pivot points remain the same distance apart, we have that imaginary link. Forget not, these example link bars are ridiculous. Remember from Suspension Basics Episode 1, the job of a link bar is to connect two components while maintaining its shape. When we alter a link bar like this, it becomes less rigid, somewhat springy, and could potentially stretch or collapse, which would be unfun. The simplest way of avoiding that kind of failure is to use just straight links. But that would make this video pointless, wouldn't it? Bent links could serve a purpose. The most common reason for using a bent link would probably be for clearance of another component. Here's a much more reasonable example. In our three-dimensional model, let's say we've got a cross member right here. This resembles the notch bridge in my wife's truck that I may have to deal with shortly. With straight links, when we compress the suspension, we see that the upper link bars contact our cross member, which prevents us from laying all the way out. We could obviously eliminate this cross member, but let's say we need to keep this bar to mount our shocks to. If we keep the pivot points the same distance apart, we can create a bar that curves around our cross member, giving us full travel and still maintaining our pinion angle. This principle is often used in production vehicles in many different ways. There are Honda rear control arms that are curved so they don't contact the body when the suspension compresses, steering tie rod ends designed to avoid contact with wheels and other components, and I've seen upper control arms that were designed to snake around steering shafts. I couldn't find an example of that one, sorry. The possible applications of this principle are endless, and it doesn't have to be suspension related. I mentioned in a previous video that I was commissioned to build a set of suicide doors. The shape of the door required the use of a single hinge. A hinge that was strong enough to support the weight of the door and large enough to push the door away from the car's body when opening didn't exist. So I had to make hinges from scratch. The challenge was hiding this huge hinge. No one wants to see hinges on the outside of a car, unless you like Jeeps. So they needed to be mounted behind the rear fender. That said, just like the link bar that we bent around the cross member, this hinge needed to be designed to allow a full 90 degree swing 
without touching the fender. The result was this crazy shaped hinge. Even though the hinge was far from straight, it still operated like it was. Once again, remember that curving a link bar will make it less rigid and more likely to flex or collapse. I am not an engineer, so I can't tell you in scientific terms how to strengthen a bent bar, so I'll just leave it at this. If you're going to build a bent link for clearance, make the bend minor and use tougher material. In other words, if you were planning on using eighth wall tubing, maybe use quarter wall instead. Gussets are always a good idea if you've got room. Overbuilt, maybe. Heavy, absolutely. More rigid, I hope so. Coming up on Garage Fab, I've talked about pinion angle a lot in these suspension basics videos. I think it's time we learn why pinion angle is such a big deal. It's one of those topics that blew my mind, so don't miss it. And all these suspension videos get put to use as we start rebuilding my wife's suspension. Thank you for your time, everyone, and hey, GarageFab passed 2,000 subscribers last week. That is insane. I recently learned that YouTube doesn't care about a channel's subscriber count as much as its likes. So, for you, hit the subscribe button so you know when a new video comes out. And for me, if you found value in this video, please hit the like button. Thanks again. And until the next one, my friends, keep moving forward.